Good morning, guys. Good Sunday morning. I'm glad to see you. Hope you are ready for some Bible study this morning. We are continuing in the book of Acts. Uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter 14, so get your swords out. Let's get ready to dive into them. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We ask you, Father, to open our hearts and our minds to truth this morning, Lord, that will transform us into that that you've called us to be, Lord, individually, collectively, as followers of Christ, Lord, help us to be willing to do what it takes to do your will. I thank you, Father, for each person that takes the time, and I pray blessings, Father, upon each person that they, takes the time to listen uh, to this Bible study, Lord, but more than that, that I pray blessings. I know you will give blessings to each one that considers the word and then does it. Bless us, Father. We look forward to seeing what you got for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are continuing on mission, but we, we, we swapped pages a few weeks ago to where we were looking at dying with Christ and what that looks like in the person on mission. If you are a Christian, God has ordained you a mission in life. Uh, some of us have, or all of us have missions that are in common. In other words, all of us are to make disciples. All of us to, are to love. I mean, there's certain things, if you want to know what the will of God is, the, the Bible says, and it's common for all of us, but each of our missions will look different, and they're, they're based on God's will and who you are as a person. Usually your passions are pretty good indicators of, of what his will is for you. Not always, but, but pretty good. And so being on mission means that you are purposefully following the will of God in your specific life. You know what it is and that you're following that will, whatever that looks like with God. And so we've gotten to the place where it says we must die with Christ. And, and obviously Christ's death was a sacrifice and so we must sacrifice ourselves. And, and, and Jesus said that all other relationships, all other things, not just our relationship with people, but our relationship with things, ought to appear as hate in comparison to our devotion, our love for Jesus Christ. And, and so, you know, I've been thinking about that in my own personal life and, and what does that look like? And of course, there were some things in my life uh, for me personally that had to fall by the wayside that were easy to identify. Uh, I think I, I know I had already identified them, but I just I was not willing to to let them go so that I could focus on the mission God had for me. So some of them were were very easy for me. A few of them. There are others of them that aren't quite as easy. It takes devotion. It takes practice. It takes clinging to Jesus. It takes being connected to the vine, which is Jesus Christ. And, uh, and sometimes, just let's just be frank, we don't want to do that. We want to do our own thing. We want to take a break. We want to do... And yet, that's not really the mission. That's, God didn't call you to be on break. God didn't call you to pleasure. God called you, unfortunately, I guess, to pain, uh, to sacrifice, to um, being always being the outsider, um, to, to not identifying with the world system, but identifying with Christ, whatever that cost. And so we're going to see that this morning in the life of Paul and Barnabas as they're on their first missionary journey together and God is doing an amazing work. We see it in Acts chapter uh, 14. And so I just want to remind you what we've already seen is Paul and Barnabas pretty much get ran out of every town they're in, <laughs> sadly for them. So if you're in Christianity for popularity, you're probably in the wrong spot. Um, you're not usually going to be popular. I find that to be true even uh, as a pastor. Uh, you know, a lot of people won't endure. I, I remember one time I was pre preaching a revival up in Alabama and someone came to me and said, do you preach like this at your church? And I said, yes. And he said, do you have anybody that is in your church? <laughs> And what he meant was, I preach the full counsel of God, and most people don't want to hear that. They want to hear what is comfortable. We, we, not they, we want to hear what is comfortable to us. We want to hear what makes us feel good about our current circumstance and our current choices. And I just want to tell you that, that unless you are completely in line with the will of God, 
it shouldn't be that way in church. You, you shouldn't be comfortable. You should be very uncomfortable with the message, um, n- not from me, but from the Word of God. I mean, the message for me really doesn't matter, but the message from the Word of God matters uh, both here in this life and in eternity. And so I just want to encourage you to not get discouraged when the message is hard. Um, that, that, that is testing your faith and that is growing your patience and growing your perseverance so that you'll be able to handle what the world is going to throw at you. And if you can't even handle what the preacher throws at you on Sunday morning, the world is going to eat you alive. And, and so I just, I just want to encourage you with that. Of, I never mean to hurt any of your feelings. I, honestly, I don't. Uh, it's not my nature, and any of you that know me personally know that's absolutely true. It's not my nature, but the Word of God is a two-edged sword, and it cuts both ways. I mean, it really cuts us to help us, not to hurt us. That's not the intent is to hurt you. The intent is to take the blinders off your eyes, off your ears, off your minds, off your heart, to tenderize you up so that you can actually hear the voice of God, know the will of God, and be in the mission of God. I mean, that's the purpose of preaching is, is those things. And so I just want you to keep that in mind as we're looking through difficult passages. Chapter 14, the same things happened in Iconium. <laughs> Poor old Paul and Silas. Uh, Paul and Barnabas went into the Jewish synagogue and preached with such power that great numbers, both Jew and Greeks, believed, became believers. Great numbers, it says. They preach with such power as we know. The Jewish establishment does not like great numbers going to become followers of Christ, followers of the way. And so some of the Jews, however, spurned God's word, uh, God's message, and poisoned the minds of Gentiles against um, Paul and Barnabas. And so not only would they not receive the message, but now they're enlisting people um, who are weaker than they, who don't have the mind to think for themselves, they are poisoning their minds against Paul and Barnabas. But it's not against Paul and Barnabas. It's against God's message. As you see, they're not poisoning. I want to tell you, when you take on a, a man of God, a person of God, I won't say just a man of God, but a person of God, you better be very careful. If that person is wrong, God will deal with them. If that person is right, God will deal with you. And, and, and the way God deals with you, he's very merciful. He's always right. But, but God does not take lightly your rejecting his word. And so some of these Jews rejected or spurned God's message. Now they poisoned the minds against Paul and Barnabas, but the, they rejected the word of God. So keep that in mind when you're on mission and you're teaching truth, you're preaching truth, you're delivering or sharing truth, there are going to be a lot of people who are receptive to that. They may not take it, but they're at least receptive and respectful of that. But there are going to be some absolutely cannot stand it. And not only will they reject the message of God, but they will poison people's minds against you. And so you just need to be prepared for that. Being a Christian is not just a warm, fuzzy unicorn. <laughs> but that's what we think. That's what we've been told. And that's, that's the car we were sold is that, oh, Christian life is such a warm, fuzzy feeling. It is not at all. That is completely contrary to the Word of God. And we see it in, in uh, the apostles' life here. We see it in Paul and Barnabas' life here is that they, they preach the true message. But there are people... Who, who just can't stand it, and they're going to work against you. They're not just going to not like the message you preach, but they're going to whisper behind the scenes. And God help the whisperers is all I can say, because God doesn't take that very lightly. And, and so, but, I, but, I won't, but don't lose sight. They, they weren't there to win a popularity contest. They were there in that city to win converts to Jesus Christ. You see, we, we, we lose focus. We think that we're in town to gain public opinion, a positive public opinion, and obviously we want to reflect positively on our Lord, but that we didn't come to town for that. We're in the business of making converts, making disciples, people who will follow Jesus Christ, leading people to the point that they will accept Jesus Christ um, by faith. That's the purpose. 
And and so would you agree with me that even though uh, we're about to have some, some bad situation, that Paul and Barnabas were incredibly successful? Now, if you looked at the circumstance of the day, their mission would look like failures because every town they go to, they get run out of. There's always this person trying to get in there, this group of people who are, are, are trying to hurt them. And I want to show you that not only do they, do they do it with words, but they're going to do it with rocks. So, so it's not just a verbal assault. It's going to be a physical assault on them. But Paul and Barnabas, God still calls them there. You need to understand that. God doesn't call you to safety. God calls you to boldness. And, and, and yes, he is our refuge. And yes, no one can snatch us out of his hand. And ultimately, we're going to be at home. But that does not necessarily mean your physical safety. And, and I know that that is popular because we want, we want to, oh, God is my fortress. God, I can run to you. But I just want to tell you that many, many, many people who have followed Christ have died horrible deaths. It doesn't make a lot of converts, does it? But they considered God worth it. That's the key. Is God worth it? So my question to you is, what does it take to get you out of the will of God? What will it take? The overriding message in this lesson, in this chapter, is what will it take to get you to stop doing what God has called you to do, to get you off mission. What will that take? Paul and Barnabas here have got people talking against them. None of us like that. I hate that. Um, and and as, as I'm sure you do. So the next time you're tempted to do it, remember how bad you hate it, and maybe it'll stop your tongue. We hate it. No one likes to get talked about. I, I don't think. Uh, no one enjoys being talked about in a in a negative way. But so so there's the first assault. But it doesn't matter to Paul and Barnabas. Some of the Jews, however, were spurned the God message and were uh, poisoned the minds of the Gentiles. Verse three. But the apostles stayed there a long time. The words didn't bother them. And I will tell you, there have been times in my own personal life where I've been the victim of a uh, of a, a verbal assault by several in the church. Oh, to my face, they were usually, oh, Brother Randall, we love you, we love you, love you, we're with you, oh, yeah, we're with you. But behind my back, they were anything but with me. And, you know, I just want you to be aware that when you talk about people, not just me in particular, but when you talk about people, the devil is always going to get you to talk about that person, and then he's going to make sure that that person receives some kind of message that you usually is perverted, not always, because sometimes you do enough damage that he doesn't even have to pervert the message. He just tells it like you said it. Uh, but usually it's perverted. But I, I want to tell you, he plays both sides of the field. He, he gets you to say what you shouldn't say, and then he takes it to the person you said it about, and he makes sure that it gets there to that person. So I, I just want you to know. And then also God says, whatever is done in darkness will be brought to light. And so... Even God reveals that. Now, the devil does it for harm. He wants to harm you. He wants to harm the person that you talked about. God wants to strengthen you and show you the error of your way to discipline you. And so that's why God allows what you do in darkness to be brought to light. But in, in this way, the apostles stayed there a long time. They kept on preaching boldly, the Bible says, about the grace of the Lord. And the Lord approved or proved their message uh, was true by giving them the power to do miraculous signs and wonders. So, so look, they stated that. I wonder if they had tucked tail and ran, would they have known the power to do miraculous signs and wonders? Now, some people say that you don't get to do miraculous signs and wonders. I think God can do anything he wants. I don't think it happens wholesale. I mean, it didn't happen wholesale in Paul's life. He didn't just everywhere he go do a miraculous wonder. Um, so I don't believe that at all. But I also don't buy into the fact that God doesn't do miraculous wonders anymore because I believe he does. I just believe we don't stay in the fight or in the mission long enough to see it. God uses it not so that people will say, whoo, look at Randall. God uses it so that he can verify, man, there's something too. There's some validity to what these people are doing. And Paul and, uh, Paul and Barnabas stayed here long enough that God, not only did they continue preaching boldly, he honored their faith by giving signs and wonders, but the people of the town were divided in their opinion. 
Wow. Your opinion. Uh, I, I just want to tell you, um, church, that your opinion really isn't worth squat. And I know that sounds bad. But really, isn't what God thinks about the situation more important than what you think about the situation? I, I hate Facebook. I, I don't even know what Twitter, Twitter, whatever it is. I don't know what that is. I don't know what Jigalig or, or Booty Jump or I, I don't know what all these social media places are. But I'm going to tell you, they're places for cowards. Because people will say things on there that they wouldn't, they don't have the courage to say in person. Now, obviously, it can be used for good, but most of the time it's not. Let's just be honest. Most of the time it, we, we do it to take digs at each other or digs at some somebody that we don't even know. And so I just want to encourage you to, instead of spending a lot of time on social media, why don't you spend a lot of time being social with your neighbors? Uh, that, that means a whole lot more to God, and it'll mean a whole lot more to your community. Um, okay, moving on. Um, stay there preaching signs and wonders. The people in town were divided in their opinion. Now, they've seen signs and wonders. They've heard the truth, and they even have the testimony of people in their town whose lives have been changed, but they're still divided about their opinion. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. So so what we've got here is us and them now happening in, in the group. Uh, I can remember in America when it really wasn't us and them so much. It was us and them, people who were our enemies. Now it's like us and them. You know, it's like politicians work to make different factions in society hate each other. I, maybe I'm way off base on that, so that's not the Bible, but I, it's just my observation. Um, but I just want to tell you, church, that God doesn't see it as us and them. Uh, it's It's us. And God wants us to reach the lost. Um, and, and that's the purpose. That all lives matter. Your life matters to God. And it should matter to Christians. No, no matter your political affiliation, no matter your sexual orientation or your gender preference or all that kind of stuff, I let God hash all that out with you because that's what he does. That's what the Holy Spirit does. My requirement is to respect you, to love you. Now, I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to agree with you. I'm not going to say that what you're doing is right when the Bible clearly says that it's wrong. But I'm also, I'm also not going to disrespect you. I'm not going to demean you. I'm not going to laugh or point at you. I don't. That has no place in a Christian walk, especially if we hope to reach that person for Christ. And so... Um, so I just want you to understand, get out of that us and them. It's, it's us with God, and God loves all of us, okay? The mob of the Gentiles and the Jews, along with their leaders, decided to attack and stone them. And I want to tell you, when, when people can no longer handle the truth, and it seems as if our society is getting there, they resort to violence. If you won't willingly submit to the world, the world will always resort to violence. Always. It's just the way of Satan. And so I just want you to understand that, that your truth that you're going to teach, yes, it's going to usually, it starts with a whisper and a slander campaign and we just hate you and, and it polarizes people. None of that is your fault. But at some point, those polar opposites of you are going to follow their master. And when, when the verbal assault doesn't work, it's going to become physical. Well, we, we see it in our society now. It's not new. It's, it's kind of always been. But in our society, at least in the South, we've always had manners um, that, that mattered. And we always understood that my rights end where your rights begin. So I don't have the right to physically assault you. Um, just because I don't agree with you. I don't, I don't have that right. Um, that's completely un-American, um, by, by our constitution, by our bill of rights. That's completely un-American. We have the right to peaceful protest, but we don't have the right to attack another human, as Christians or any other thing, I don't have the right. I, I remember many years ago, someone, they were blowing up abortion clinics. We don't have that right. Yeah, do you feel that way? Yes, because you, you feel so helpless to stop the, the carnage of murdering babies that 
you feel justified by taking matters into your own hands and, and doing evil. But God doesn't accomplish good by evil. And so that was not good. That was not God. They'd say, oh, we're doing it in the name of God. No, they weren't. They were doing it because they lacked faith that God knew how to handle it. That's, that's, that's the reason. A peaceful protest is fine, but when you resort to violence, that's not God-ordained. That's not American. It's just, it's just my rights end where your rights begin. So that's just not the way. But the mob, verse 5, then the mob of Gentiles and Jews, along with their leaders, decided to attack and stone them. So for those of you that don't know what stoning is, stoning is they gather around, if they have a pit, usually it's on the outside of town, usually it's the garbage pit, but if they have a pit outside of town, then what they'll do is they'll take you outside of town, throw you in that pit, and then they will all line, you know, circle around or whatever and have rocks, and they just keep throwing rocks at you until you're dead. I mean, that's 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 stoning. That's the simplest way to understand it, you know, and and... That was a form of justice in there. That's how they silence somebody, and it's incredibly effective in that when you're uh, when you're being stoned, uh, you know, eventually you're silenced. So, so, but, but I want to I want to share this with you because it was a thought that came to me. So, Paul is being stoned here. I wonder if he's remembering Stephen. And for those of you that don't know, you'll have to go back and read about Stephen. But Paul commissioned the stoning of Stephen. Stephen, while he was being stoned, continued to preach the word of God. Man, they just kept hold at him. And then he saw, I mean, you know, same thing happened to Stephen. And I wonder if Paul, in this stoning, had flashbacks to, to Stephen. Uh, you know, just, just random. Um, when the apostles learned of it, they fled the region uh, of a Lyconia to the towns of Leicester and Derby and the surrounding areas. And there they preached the good news. So, so the people fled. When they heard about the stoning, um, they, they fled. Uh, and, and they preached the good news. All right. While they were in Leicester, Paul and Barnabas came upon a man who was crippled in his feet. Now this guy had been crippled his entire life. Um, and the Bible says from birth. And he never walked, and he was sitting and listening as Paul preached. And so notice that he is intrigued by what Paul is saying. Looking straight at him, Paul realized that he had faith. So Paul had discernment here. He could look at this guy and tell that this guy had enough faith to walk. Now that's, you know, I don't know that interaction. I don't know exactly. I'm just, I'm just reading to you what the Word of God says. Paul identified in this man in some way. I have to believe it was the discernment of the Holy Spirit that this guy had. So Paul called him with a loud voice and said, stand up. Now, you know, get the picture again. We've just been running out of town because they're going to stone us. They didn't actually stone us, but they're going, uh, they were going to. And so we left. Um, they get to the next town in this area and there's a cripple guy there and uh, Paul begins to do exactly what got him thrown out of town and tried to get stoned in the last place. Um, Paul does that again. He sees this guy who, who um, is crippled from birth, notices that he has enough faith through discernment to walk. And so Paul yells and says, stand up. Man, you want to talk about faith? Paul's got some kind of incredible faith in God, doesn't he? Stand up. So the man jumped up to his feet and started walking. Now, just so you don't think, well, hey, this was a plant. I know how I know how the devil works, and I also know how critical minds work. That, oh, Paul had that guy there. Listen, Paul hadn't been to this town, A. They just got to town, B, and everybody in town knew this guy. He's been crippled and in this town since birth. So this isn't a plant. This isn't like, you know, the... the uh, Things the way Hollywood portrays us, and in truth, the way uh, some of the healers, healers uh, on television were. This this is an actual healing uh, that wasn't a plant, wasn't so you could put more money in their pot so they can buy an Irish car. This was actually God, uh, Paul, uh, God using Paul. And so the man started walking. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in their local diamond, These guys are gods. These guys are gods. Now, you remember what happened to the last guy that they said these, that he's a god. He has the voice of a god, and he, he took the accolades, worms ate him up. 
Well, that's not. So, um, so they decided that Paul was the Greek god. Zeus, I mean, that Barnabas was the Greek god Zeus, and Paul was Hermes, since he was the chief speaker. Hermes was the spokesman for the fake gods. Um, so, if you know anything about Greek mythology, anyway. Now, the temple of Zeus was located just outside of the town. So, the priest of the temple. And the crowds brought bulls and wreaths of flowers to the town gates, and they prepared to offer sacrifices to the apostles. Now, I want to share something with you just about um, fake religion or false religion. These priests, now, I'm not going to throw rocks at them because we can say the same thing about the Jews. We can also say the same thing about the church. These priests have no idea who their God is. If, if two people who just walk into town do something, I mean, it's miraculous, yes, but, but, but they, don't, they can't even identify their own gods. They, they think these two men are gods. They think Zeus. Now, in, in their defense, Zeus was claimed to take on human form and do all manner of, of things, crazy things. Um, so I can understand completely where these guys would have considered that. Um, but I just want you to understand that the difference church between the Jews and this group of people is that you have the Holy Spirit of God in you. Now, the, group, the Jews have the Word of God with them, but you have it in them. You have it in you. And so you ought to instantly be able to discern what is of God and what is not of God, um, unlike these people. So they, they brought out, so get the picture. Paul is coming to town. Paul and Barman is coming to town. Paul sees this guy, tells him to stand up. The guy stands up and walks. Everybody knows it's a miracle. Word, the people shout, oh, in their dialect, oh, it's the gods. It's Zeus and Hermes have come to see us. And so the priests come out. They brought some bulls because they're about to sacrifice. They, won't, they don't want to make Zeus and Hermes upset. And so they bring some guys out to sacrifice or some, uh, an offering out to sacrifice but when Paul, when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard what was happening, they tore their clothes in dismay and ran out among the people shouting. Uh, tearing of your clothes is deep anguish. Uh, and, and shouting, friends, why are you doing this? We are human beings. We're not gods. We're not gods. We're just like you. We have come to bring you good news that you should turn from these worthless things Zeus and Hermes and, and, and all that, and turn to the living God who made heaven and earth, the sea, and everything in them. So Paul begins to preach a message. He says, look, I'm not a God, and that, that you're worshiping is not a God, but I can tell you about a God who made all of this. So he begins to preach a message. In the past, he permitted all nations to go their own way, but he never left them without evidence of himself and his goodness for instance, he sends you rain and good crops and gives you food and joyful hearts. But even with these words, Paul and Barnabas could scarcely retain or restrain the people from sacrifice. So Paul is saying, look, I'm not a God. God has blessed you, and, and this is how he's blessed you, and he wants, he wants you to know him. But the people aren't having it. They're, just, they're continually coming at them. Uh, wanting to sacrifice them. Then some Jews arrived from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowds to their side. So the same folks that had tried to stone them in the last town have now caught up to them. All right, so understand that. And, and now they're doing the same thing. So this is how fickle people are. I mean, they're trying to offer to them. Paul said, no, don't offer to me. And now these, this group of people have come into town. The Jews have arrived and won the crowd, that's, that's how fickle they are, over to their side, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of town thinking he was dead. So right in that moment, they stoned Paul. So they went from, oh, you're a god, you're, you're Zeus, let's kill the cows, to, but they completely forgot about the crippled man. Do you see how Satan can blind people very quickly? It's, it's like the, the, the parable of the, the souls and, and, and God does something in somebody's life and almost instantly the bird, it falls on a hard, it falls on a hard heart or a hard surface and instantly the birds, being Satan, comes and gets it and takes it away. 
and that's that's what's happened here. It's the first soil is is that these people were offered truth. Paul showed them a miraculous that you know not every day this kind of thing happens. But just how quickly Satan can blind you. He took the seed that God planted there. And now the one they were worshiping, they've stoned. They think he's dead. Not, but they think he is. Dragged him out of town. Man, you want to talk about a tough ministry. We're, we're upset when a business meeting doesn't go the way we want it to. And Paul's getting stoned to death here for the gospel. That's it's crazy. Um, so, But the believers gathered around him and got him up and went back into the town. <laughs> wow. The next day they left, uh, he left with Barnabas for Derby. All right, now we're in Derby. After preaching the good news in Derby and making many disciples, Paul and Barnabas did something stupid. They go back. I mean, do you see their devotion to the will of God and to the people of God and to their enemy? It's, it's difficult to uh, sometimes to be devoted to God because we live in such a tangible world and sometimes God can seem very untangible, especially if we don't pray, we don't study, we don't commune with him, we don't receive him. I mean, if he, he sometimes can seem very untangible to us. And, and then likewise, people who hate us, they're not untangible. We just don't want them around us at all. The only group we want around us is people who agree with us and who will agree with us and who are sweet to us. And yet Jesus says, what have you done? If you love people who love you, what have you really done? You're, you're receiving a reward. Love those that don't love you. Love your enemy. And so in this particular case, Paul and Barnabas, I mean, Paul has literally, they thought they killed him they hit him with so many rocks that they thought he was dead. Right? Don't lose that. Don't, don't just skim over that. That's, that's, <laughs> that's significant. And yet, instead of Paul, Paul saying, let's get out of town, he's still listening to the will of God. And he says, we're going back. They were strength, uh, uh, where they strengthened the believers they encouraged them to continue in their faith, reminding them that we must suffer. We must suffer many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Paul and Barnabas has appoint, Paul and Barnabas appointed elders. With fasting and praying, they turned the elders over to the care of the Lord and in whom they had put their trust. Then they traveled back to Pisidia in Pamphylia. Um, they preached the word in Persia. Then they went down to, uh, to Adalia. Finally, uh, they returned to the ship, uh, by ship to Antioch of Syria, where they had journeyed, where their journey had began. So we've made the, the ministry circle, and now we're going back to where it all started. So, so Paul and Barnabas have, have, have gone. They started off as Barnabas and Saul, if you'll remember, on this missionary journey. And then the Jews rejected them. And so they said, we're going to the Gentiles. And from that point, it was Paul and Barnabas and continued to be Paul and Barnabas. I just want you to know that it was Paul that was stoned, not Barnabas. Um, but, but now they've gone back through the region that God called them to just to make sure the churches are doing well, just to strengthen them, just to set up leadership in the church so that the church wouldn't flounder and continue to do because they said, listen, you're going to serve for hardships. You need to understand, can you imagine when Paul walks into town and he's covered with bruises and abrasions and all these things, knots on his head, where people, and they say, well, you know, what happened to you? I got stoned. And, and, and not this way. You know, I got stoned. You know, people were literally trying to throw rocks at me and they thought I was dead. And, and, and instead of running from all that, he, he, he goes. Then he goes back to the church that commissioned this journey. You remember, they started this journey by praying and fasting. And, and, and only two, there were five of them, but only two of them were chosen to go, Paul and Barnabas. And the, and, and, but they fasted and prayed. And imagine... Imagine how many times it went through their minds that God told us to come here and we're getting treated terrible. You know, you don't see a complaint, you don't hear a complaint, it's not recorded in the Bible, but you know they're human. You know it had to go through their mind what's going on here. We don't, we don't understand why we're getting all this resistance when God ordained us. He told us to come. Surely he knew. 
that this was going to happen. So they returned. Where the journey began, the believers there had entrusted them to the grace of God to do the work that they now completed. So they have now gone on a complete missionary journey, and they have finished the job. They get back to the church who had entrusted them uh, to go. Upon arriving, they called the church together and reported everything that God had done through them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles too. Now listen, do you hear a whining party? You won't believe how they treat us. We went this down. They did this. We, there was this one guy. He 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 was demon possessed. He, he claimed he was a Jew, but he was he was a sore. We just we kicked his butt. Well, blah, blah, blah. they didn't say any of that. They, I mean, the report is God opened opportunities of faith. Do you see how how important that relationship was? That nothing was going to knock them off the will of God. So I'll go back to my initial question. What would it take? What does it take or what is, what is currently happening that has you out of the will of God? And I hope you get back on mission. Is it going to be easy? No, I'm not going to promise you that. People are going to like you? I can promise you that. But is it worth it? Do, is that relationship with Jesus Christ primary so that whatever happens to you, you consider worth it so that the gospel is proclaimed? Man, God's good, isn't he? See you next time.